heat waves. Tick. Heat waves. Tick. Severe droughts. Tick. 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 Devastating. Devastating hurricane. Tick. 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 Our future is up to you. What is the biggest environmental problem facing humanity? John? <laughs> I, I think, we, 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 listen, they're, they're all important and they're all tied together. But if you had to, if you had to underscore one, it would be global warming mm -hmm. as, it, as, it, as it cuts through so many other issues. So this film isn't really about global warming. You can read any major publication or see Al Gore's movie if you aren't already convinced. But what I wanted to know was, can we get by just conserving and slowly increasing the amount of wind and solar power we use? Or do we need a new strategy entirely? One of the issues with uh, green energy is, is whether there, we could implement it to uh, a degree where we'd really get enough enough energy from it so it looks right now that that contribution from green energy would still be rather small you know, maybe in the na neighborhood of five to fifteen percent I think that if we want to move forward with a highly technological society where we can have video cameras and, and iPods and, and, and I think more importantly communicate with each other around the globe um, we're going to need more energy not less so I think that's true I think the global climate change issue is a very, very serious one, and Greenpeace yeah. people would agree with that. Most of what, what the, the wind and solar have important roles, I think very important roles, particularly in certain areas, um, but they can't be everywhere and they can't be all the time. And if you look at folks who look at the electrical grid, they come to the conclusion that somewhere in the range of 15 to 20, maybe 25% of the electricity on a wide grid can be supplied by these things that vary in time and space. Yeah. But that if you want to run a technological society like the one we have, um, you need major base load, base load electricity that is a steady source. Okay, so let's look at this chart. This shows the breakdown of electricity production in the United States. Coal produces about half of our electricity. And although wind and solar are great, together they make up only about 1% of our total electricity needs, and likely won't be too much greater in the future. And whether you like hydroelectric power or not, it's already pretty much built out to capacity. Nuclear energy currently produces about 20% of the electricity in the United States. In other industrial nations, this percentage is often greater. In France, for example, 78% of their electricity comes from nuclear power. A lot of us back in 1981 were thinking that uh, nuclear energy was bad, and a lot of us protested, and a lot of us worked against it. And I think most of us still would rather not have it. Um, unfortunately, with the more and more information about global warming, it, uh, it looks like we are really in for a hot planet, uh, the way things are going, and uh, the only way to level it off might be nuclear energy. Nuclear power, we view, is providing a good transition to the energy technologies of tomorrow. And nuclear energy is much preferred to fossil fire generation for acid rain and global warming and a bunch of other the environmental consequences of mining is much worse for fossil fuel than it is for uh, nuclear power. So there's a number of reasons why nuclear power is better than fossil fuel. Definitely not all environmentalists embrace nuclear power though. The, the amazing thing is nuclear power, even if you could take care of um, the security threat, and even if you could solve the political problem of what to do with the waste, Right? If you think of that waste, then you think that if the Babylonians had used nuclear power, we would still be dealing with their waste, right? So even if you can get past those two, which you, you can, but let's say you could, and let's say you could double the amount of the number of nuclear plants in the world today. I think, boy, that would really go a long way to solving global warming. 
it would be one of about 15 things. It would be about a 15th of the solution. And that puts it in perspective because the nuclear industry is really playing it, playing it unfairly here in trying to say that <clears throat> nuclear power is the answer to fossil fuels. There isn't an answer to fossil fuels. Nuclear power deserves to be in the debate. It's one option. And it appears to me that the public is going to say it's far too dangerous, it's far too risky, that is an insane way to generate electricity. So we've looked at it and it gets discarded yet again. And then we have to look at everything else. The transitioning through um, some of the less, uh, less problematic fossil fuels like natural gas, the bringing on of wind and solar, the, the attempt at building a green hydrogen economy. This is where the subsidies have to go. This is where the emphasis has to go. General Electric right now is looking at all of these, right? It's looking at nuclear because it could make a fortune off the subsidies of nuclear. But it's also looking at wind. It's also looking at solar. It's also looking at geothermal. You know, the goal will be to help companies like GE make a fortune off the technologies that are going to be a real answer, that aren't going to poison us, and keep them away. We don't want Congress subsidizing the deadly industry, um, uh, the deadly nuclear industry. Patrick Moore, a former member of Greenpeace, disagrees. Moore and a few other environmentalists have recently come out in support of nuclear power. Moore writes, Nuclear energy is the only large-scale, cost-effective energy source that can reduce emissions while continuing to satisfy a growing demand for power. And these days, it can do so safely. Okay, so in theory, nuclear power could possibly be good for the environment. But are human beings as vigilant and as competent as we need to be to make sure that no mistakes are made? I know that you've worked at a nuclear power plant in the past, um, and when you worked back then, did you consider it safe? Well, actually, I worked in nuclear research, uh, okay. and uh, so there was a 200 megawatt nuclear reactor that I was intimately involved with, but it wasn't for the purposes of power, actually. It was a, it was a research reactor. Uh, but nonetheless, it's the same same device, same kind of machine, and uh, yeah, I felt absolutely safe because the safeguards that were put in place were were solid. And uh, beyond that, uh, the whole thing was was extremely well shielded. Now, do you consider um, power plants today safe? Well, most of them, yeah. I mean, they're all built now with uh, with containment vessels, uh, unlike Chernobyl, which did not have a containment vessel. Uh, but they're all built today in, in Western countries with all kinds of uh, safeguards and regulations to govern how they're built and uh, the operation, regulations covering the operations. So it's a safe industry today. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it comes not without cost, but uh, nonetheless it's a safe industry today. So what is the cost of nuclear energy and how does it compare to other energy sources? It is well known that nuclear energy is comparable to coal in cost and cheaper than natural gas and oil. Another important question to ask is, how long will our uranium supplies last us? A study conducted by the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency found that the Earth's crust contained at least 35 million tons of uranium available for exploitation. This is enough to last more than 630 years at today's level of nuclear energy production. If we were to increase nuclear energy production, though, this number would be considerably less. Another benefit of uranium fuel is that it is found in more politically stable nations like Australia, South Africa, and Canada. 
So regardless of what you think about nuclear power, it's good to know some history. Back in the 1950s, Walt Disney made a famous TV episode of Tomorrowland called Our Friend the Atom. This helps to explain nuclear energy basics. 92, uranium, the famous radioactive element. Here, nature has crowded so many protons and neutrons into the nucleus that it becomes unstable. Finally, it throws out a small fragment, and in this way, radioactive rays are born. These rays cannot be seen, heard, or felt. The Geiger counter is used to detect their presence. It gives off audible clicks when the rays pass through it. The neutron is an ideal bullet. Since it is neutral, it isn't deflected by the electrical charge of the atoms and flies through them in a straight course. Finally, it struck a nucleus. The uranium nucleus split in two. Atomic fission had been accomplished. But this wasn't all that happened. Two neutrons were released from the split nucleus. One bullet was used to split the atom, and two new ones were created in the process. Now we have two neutrons to split two atoms. This implied a fabulous prospect, a nuclear chain reaction in uranium. Let's go back to our mousetrap atoms. We can create a chain reaction with them. We'll use our two ping pong balls for neutrons. They will be released when the atom splits. Now all these mouse traps are the atoms that will be in the game. They are set, loaded, and ready to go. To start the chain reaction, all we need is one neutron. It has to trigger just one trap. The ping pong balls that are released will set off two other traps. And then we'll have four balls flying to trigger more traps. I think you can see what is going to happen. Watch. An atomic chain reaction works in exactly the same way. One neutron is enough to start it. wondered if atomic energy had better remained a secret forever. An atomic blast is more than a threat. It is also a regretful waste of heat and radiation. To make this energy useful, the explosion must be slowed down. Atomic scientists produce slow nuclear chain reactions within the famous atomic reactor. It's really just a furnace with thick concrete walls to encase the atomic fire. Blocks of uranium serve as atomic fuel. To slow down the chain reaction, control rods that absorb neutrons are inserted in the blocks. These rods act like a damper in the furnace and catch some of the flying neutrons and take them out of play. This allows fewer atoms to split and keeps the reactor burning almost endlessly at an even temperature. With the chain reaction thus under control, the mighty atom can be put to use. The heat is picked up by a liquid that is piped through the hot core of the reactor. The heated liquid is then run through a boiler where it produces an almost endless stream of hot steam. Steam for power. 
here we are, burning up our coal and oil only to produce power. But now we have a new source of power, clean, silent, plentiful. Coal and oil can now be saved for better things. We can use them for making plastics, dyes, textiles and drugs. The Disney program wasn't completely accurate. Today, instead of uranium blocks, nuclear reactors use uranium fuel pellets. Just one of these one-half inch pellets can produce the same amount of electricity as one ton of coal or three barrels of oil. The pellets are placed into long tubes that make up the fuel assembly. There are 100 to 200 of these fuel assemblies in the reactor core. Every one to two years the reactor has to shut down to replace these fuel assemblies. Okay, now what about that uranium rock? Isn't the radiation from that something that we need to worry about? If you live near a nuclear power plant, do you get radiation? And what are the types of things that you get radiation from? Well, uh, this is, this is perhaps one of the um, worst understood aspects of nuclear power. And this is one that, say, most scientists um, recognize is, is just bad information to the population. Or maybe not bad information, but, but people don't understand risk. Uh -huh. um, the fact of the matter is that uh, if you live near a nuclear power plant, um, there's no evidence, so far as I know, that you get any more radiation than if you don't live near a nuclear power plant. The shielding around nuclear power plants is very good. Uh, nothing is perfectly risk-free. Everything has some risk. And so it doesn't make sense to shield anything so that there's zero radiation that comes out. You instead shield it so that there's no more radiation that comes out that you can detect because there's always a radiation bombarding us. We, we, get, we get radiation from outer space, you know, uh, and, and our atmosphere shields us from a lot of it, but the higher you go in the atmosphere, actually the less shielding and you get more radiation. When you get a dental x-ray, you get radiation. Uh, there are, in the soil, if you have a sensitive um, detector, you can go out and detect radiation in the soil. Uh, of course, there's radon gas in the soil, but there's also, there's remnants of, of uranium in the soil. Um, and uh, there are other kinds of, of things. And so, you, you know, there is radiation all around us. We're constantly being bombarded with it. The Davis-Bessey power plant had a chart with the breakdown of the average radiation that a person is exposed to each year. More than half of the radiation you receive is from radon from the ground. Medical x-rays also contribute a little. If you look at the bottom of the chart, you'll see that coal plants actually release more radiation than nuclear plants. And so there are many ways that we are normally bombarded with radiation and the nuclear power uh, plant uh, doesn't really increase radiation at all. I mean, I look at what we live, you know, every day you get in that automobile and you drive to the grocery store or you drive someplace, the risk you take on, the chances of being killed in that are so much higher, every trip really, than, than what you get from being living in the neighborhood of a, of a, of a nuclear power plant. Yeah. But of course, the fear is there'll be an accident. Yeah. And so it's, 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 you know, human nature to fear the catastrophic event mm -hmm. and to have that, even though it's so unlikely, have that drive your decision process. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that, that I think, really almost all scientists would agree that those fears are really uh, not sensible in terms of the risk-benefit, risk cost-benefit mm -hmm. analysis. But they're real. I mean, people have them. So what could possibly go wrong at one of these plants? In Jane Fonda and Jack Lemmon's movie, The China Syndrome, a nuclear accident threatens the Los Angeles region. What was that? Sounds like an earthquake. What the hell? Is... Hey, 
from the grid. Ted, stabilize the reactor. Right. Radiation containment. What level? Level eight, Jack. Okay, now, well, Gordon, relax. Must be that safety valve just opened after the trip. Yeah, it might be. Hold it. Cut down the research probe. Hi, right, Barney. Come over here and keep your eye on the feed water. And holler out those numbers if they don't start to drop. Line up the valves and put the turbine on a turning gear. Somebody turn off that goddamn alarm. Thank you. Two weeks after the China Syndrome came out, one of the reactors at Three Mile Island had a core meltdown. Ralph Nader joined Jane Fonda to protest nuclear energy. Physicist Edward Teller, the father of the hydrogen bomb, got really upset that the anti-nuclear campaign, led by Nader and Fonda, was gaining strength. He worked very hard to oppose them, giving talks and writing editorials. After working 20-hour days at the age of 71, Teller suffered a heart attack. After recovery, he took out an ad stating that he was the only victim of Three Mile Island and that nobody was hurt in the incident, and a very minimal amount of radiation was released. Teller claimed that Three Mile Island was actually a success story because it showed that in the case of an accident, nuclear power plants have good backup safety systems that protect the public. Three Mile Island was a core meltdown. The accident started from the inside out. The reactor core melted down. There was some radiation released, but the containment held that radioactivity so that not many people outside the fence received a, a detectable dose. Unlike Chernobyl, plants today, including Three Mile Island, have many layers surrounding the core. In the case of any sort of accident, these layers are designed to contain the radiation. Recently, the davis Bessey nuclear power plant in Ohio had a close call. suffer. When you get in the habit of not doing maintenance work in a nuclear power plant, you, you run the risk of having something like Davis-Bessey occur, which was a 